Vice President Joe Biden is weighing in on the attack in Dallas. It was just one of several topics he touched on in an interview late Monday with CBS Evening News anchor Scott Pelley. Mr. Vice President, thank you for your time. You met with the police officials today. What did they tell you was the effect of Dallas on their rank and file police officers? What they told us was that this was a, uh, a national tragedy, that uh, their, uh, their officers are, quite frankly, they're worried. Um, and I've, I've, you know, I have a great, I shouldn't say you know, I have a great relationship with these police organizations. I've worked with them for years and years, and I know all their leaders personally. And last time I met with them, they talked about, Joe, you don't understand, our guys are apprehensive, they're, they're frightened. And I said, am I allowed to say that? Because, you know, usually soldiers, police never acknowledge that. He said, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, you are. And so what they talked about was the, and the, the perception out there that they're basically uh, not protecting the community equally and fairly. They acknowledge that they're bad apples in every organization. But they made the case, which I think is correct, that the vast majority of police departments and officers are protecting everyone like they were in that, in that demonstration. The, the Dallas Police Department, one of the best in the country, trained in de-escalation. They were there protecting those people, their right to protest what they thought happened, what they believed happened in Louisiana and up in Minnesota. And they put their lives on the line for those people. And they made that point, and the president made that point as well. But they also, we talked about, and a couple of them talked about the need for them to reach out to the community more and acknowledge that. They understand why the community sometimes feels that they are not being treated fairly. And so that, 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 that was the start of the conversation. And then they gave us a list, Scott, of things that they needed help on. Everything from they needed help on recruiting and, and, and retaining. They needed help on money for training. Uh, um, they pointed out, one, one of the organizations pointed out, some police departments get 10 hours of training a year, and others get 100 hours of training. They need to train in de-escalation. And so, and they, and they talked about they didn't feel that, uh, that the president sufficiently uh, spoke to their concerns and, and, and his language wasn't supportive enough. And then he went through the list of all that he had said, I think some of which they hadn't heard or hadn't, it hadn't broken through. But it ended up the following way. They're going to put, we're putting together agenda. I'm going to meet with them regularly, the president occasionally, but I've been authorized to do this. Meet with them regularly. Going to bring in the community as well and begin to work our way through this in a way where the communities and the police department start to talk to one another again. A lot do now, but do it in a way we used to when we funded community policing fully, which we're and we've been pushing to increase funding for additional police officers so they can, because it's a resource-intensive effort to get out of the car, to go in and meet who owns the local drugstore, who the, 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 the local church, et cetera, so people know one another. So they don't look at that woman in a patrol car with a uniform on without realizing she's a mother with three kids who coaches basketball. And so police don't look at that kid that's let out of his house going to school with a hoodie on and realize the kid is more interested in poetry than he does in being a gangbanger. So the police officials were critical of the president to his face about yes. his level of support for police. Yes. And I think they walked away satisfied. That, you'll have to ask them that. How did but he the, satisfy them? Well, by telling them what he, reminding them what he had said and listening to their, 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 their concerns and said, I'm willing to work with you to make more progress. If you all, not if, but you have to be willing, as three of the organizations said, to reach out to the communities and acknowledge, acknowledge that there is still some institutional racism that exists. In, among some police and some departments, and you got to reach out and you got to start this conversation. And uh, I, I thought it would look. I've been doing this for longer than I want to admit, Scott. Uh, I'm the guy that wrote the cops bill. The, these are all my allies, and uh, I have. A, I come out of the civil rights movement, and they know that. And uh, I, it was. It was. I. My comment was I was proud of the meeting. You were it ended. You said that the officials said that their cops were afraid. Afraid of what? They're afraid of being targeted. 
they think there's a target on their back. They think that, uh, and, there's, and you know, there's, it's, you can understand why. Even though fewer police per year are being killed since we've been in office than in George, when George Bush was in office, and that's not a criticism of George Bush. Let me make that clear. But the, you have to put in perspective, not counting 9-11, there are an average of 164, 65, 66 police officers killed per year on average. With us, it's 132 or 135. I don't know the number. But the perception is, somehow, that a whole lot more police are being shot and or killed. But what the real perception among these guys is that since there, it seems as though the community and others think we are the problem, that we are the focus, and there's targets on our back. And there's a good reason for them to be concerned about that. Mr. Vice President, the Dallas officers were killed with armored piercing rounds. Why exactly. hasn't your administration restricted the sale of armor piercing rounds through the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives? We've been trying to do that for a long time. If you remember the first bill to it eliminate... It hasn't happened, sir. I know it hadn't. The first bill to, introduce, to stop armor pier piercing bullets was introduced by Pat Moynihan and me years ago. And so what we get is the constant, constant, constant pushback from, uh, from the gun lobby and, uh, and, 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 and the Republican Congress. What is the sporting purpose of armored piercing rounds? There is none. Zero. Zero, zero, zero. Just like there is no sporting purpose for semi-automatic uh, AR, these, these so-called assault rifles. I joke with one of the guys criticizing me at home belonging to one of the hunting organizations. I said, okay, if you want one of those rifles, are you going to give deer uh, Kevlar vest and not use piercing, uh, uh, armor piercing bullets? I mean, some of this is just beyond the realm of making common sense. What is the administration willing to do to restrict the sales of armored piercing rounds now after Dallas? Before Dallas and after Dallas, we're prepared to do everything we can to be able to do that and have it stick. It, sir, can you be more specific? I mean, are you going to do something through the ATF, or is it going to be an executive action? Well, there is a debate as to whether or not there is authority on an executive action. I think we have the authority. And there is a concern that if, in fact, we go ahead and do it, what the response will be from the United States Congress in a way that may be able to override a veto. But I'm not prepared to give you more detail at this moment except to say you are right about the total non-utility from a sporting perspective of armor-piercing bullets, and uh, we, are, we are focusing on it. Is it worth a try even if you face a veto? Uh, I've learned that I have a V in front of my name, V, Vice President, but uh, speaking for myself, I think it is worth a try. Mr. Vice President, we talk in Afghanistan and Iraq about winning the hearts and minds of people. What do the police have to do to win the hearts and minds here at home? Well, first of all, in a lot of communities, they do have the hearts and minds, but I think they have to reach out. And I have to, we have to give them the resources to reach out. And I think we have to be part of convening the neighborhoods and the police by, again, once again, funding community policing. The Republicans in the Senate and House should give us the budget request we have to increase the funding to be able to do that. And we should be talking about it relentlessly. The law enforcement community supports being able to have greater resources to go into the communities in order to be able to establish personal relationships like we did in the 90s. Vice President Biden, we're grateful for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks an awful lot.